I am at the New Mexico History Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This museum is just north of the historic Santa Fe Plaza, and it's got an old Conestoga wagon out front. That is a big but strange Rosie the Riveter in the lobby. We'll start off New Mexico's story by going way back thousands of years before recorded history. The native peoples throughout this desert region adapted to the climate by knowing the land and living within its limitations. Here are some ancestral Puebloan artifacts, including trade items like shells and turquoise jewelry. There's a bull made in the 15th century, and a finger woven sock that's nearly a thousand years old. That's a Dineta or Navajo gray jar from 1500. And then the Spanish reached New Mexico in the 1500s, first exploring the region, then permanently settling by the end of the century. They were expecting great treasures similar to the ones they found with the Incas and Aztecs, but they didn't find it here on the northern frontier. So their search for glory and gold just brought God, subjugation, and death to the natives. Here is some Spanish conquistador armor and a crossbow. There's a history of the Onatie expedition, the one that first permanently settled New Mexico, a 17th century Spanish sword, and a halberd head, a rather fanciful weapon used for axing cavalry. There's some chainmail armor with a Spanish bow and arrow, shield, and an Andarga shield. A big Spanish musket that was made in 1575, a war club used in the Pueblo Revolt on the left, along with a scary spiky collar, and some Spanish books and a 16th century map of the Americas. The Spanish did impose their will on the Pueblo peoples, which meant hard labor on haciendas and missions, and they were forced to abandon many of their beliefs and worship the Catholic God. There's a 1700s crucifix. That's a baptismal font from the early 1700s. It was found near Albuquerque. There's an old mission bell and a piece of a viga. Those were the rough honed roof timbers of buildings like missions. Here are more artifacts from missions, like an old Bible, a rosary, and that Viga fragment is from Acoma Pueblo. That's a painting memorializing the 21 Franciscan priests who were killed in the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. The revolt was the result of a century of conflict between the Spanish and Native Americans. The Pueblo people rose up against the Spanish settlers and killed over 400 of them. Many of their own died in the process, but they did successfully run the Spanish out of New Mexico for a little over a decade. This is a painting of the Nuestra Señora de la Macana a holy statue of the Virgin Mary that came to New Mexico in 1598. It was one of the most sacred relics for Catholics in the region, and a Franciscan friar saved it and carried it to Mexico during the revolt. This is the story of Nuestro Señora de la Macana, which says a Pueblo leader struck a statue of the Virgin Mary with a blade. Because of that, even the devil was outraged by the attack, so he hanged the guy. This is a portrait of Don Diego de Vargas, the Spanish governor of Santa Fe de Nuevo Mexico, during and after the reconquest of the region that started 12 years after the revolt. There's some food preparation accessories from the time of the Reconquista, including a chocolate pot and whisk. That's a portrait of the Viceroy Tomas Antonio de la Cerda y Aragon. He became Viceroy of New Spain right after the Pueblo Revolt and tried to recolonize New Mexico. This was Severino Martinez's leather overcoat from 1778. And there's some other historic clothing and other accessories. In 1779, Governor Juan Batista de Anza defeated a Comanche band, but later signed formal treaties with the Comanches, Apaches, and Navajos in order to have some semblance of peace in the region for a little bit. On the eastern side of the continent, the newly independent United States of America was rapidly expanding to the west. Eventually, the Santa Fe Trail was established that connected western Missouri cities like Independence and Kansas City with Santa Fe, now a territorial capital under the rule of Mexico. The Santa Fe Trail became a primary means of transportation between the United States Midwest, and this is a mail stagecoach used on the trail. This map shows the boundaries laid out between America and Mexico by the adams onis Treaty of 1819. Mexico was larger than the United States at this time, these are trunks that traveled along the Santa Fe Trail. The one in the back was brought by the Spiedelbergs. They were German immigrants who brought this first from Germany to America, then all along the trail. There are some artifacts used by travelers on El Camino de Santa Fe. This strong box was carried by Fernando Delgado on his trading expeditions along the trail. He sometimes carried thousands of dollars in here between St. Louis and Santa Fe. 
This is a well-traveled rosewood piano. It's in beautiful shape, but it actually traveled along the Santa Fe Trail all the way from Pennsylvania, brought by the Manderfield family. Here are some portraits of the Manderfields. In the 1860s, William Manderfield traveled the Santa Fe Trail and became part owner of a local newspaper, then eventually became a wealthy trader and financier, and also married into one of the territory's most powerful families, the Oteros. That painted fan was used by a member of the Otero Manderfield family. There's some cards used to pass the time on the Santa Fe Trail, as well as a trail book, and that painita was used by a lady of the Otero family. This fancy clock was brought from south of here. It likely traveled from Durango, Mexico to get here. That's a watch of the Speedlebergs, William Manderfield's chain, and a spyglass used on the Santa Fe Trail. That is famous frontiersman Kit Carson's beaver robe. He used this during his years as a trapper, before he became an army officer, guide, and Indian agent, and he probably killed a lot of beavers to make this. Kit Carson also owned this gaming table. Gaming was a big thing out in the Wild West, and many trappers and traders gambled away all their profits through gambling. Those are relics of frontiersmen from the mid-19th century. This is a Segesur hide painting. This animal hide painting represents an encounter between rival tribesmen with a Spanish leader accompanying them. The specific event shown here is still unknown and speculated about. Pieces of this work are still clearly missing, so it's a mystery. These are some artifacts from the Mexican-American War. While much of the fighting took place in Mexico, the U.S. sent an army at the offset of the war to conquer Santa Fe and the New Mexico Territory, which they did pretty easily. There's General Winfield Scott's campaign trunk from the war, and General Stephen Kearney's pistol and field desk. Kearney led the invasion of 1,600 troops into New Mexico, they marched along the Santa Fe Trail, and they did take Santa Fe without firing a shot. It wasn't all peaceful, though. In January 1847, the Taos Rebellion occurred. Mexican and Pueblo allies led an insurrection, but they were crushed and hundreds were killed. These are some manuscripts related to the revolt. This is a portrait of the Taos merchant and trader Charles Bent, who was appointed by the US as the first civil governor of New Mexico, but he was killed by the Taos rebels. This is the Treaty of Peace, Friendship, Limits, and Settlement, or the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the war and now enabled the US to expand across the entire continent. So after the treaty finished the war and added most of New Mexico territory to the Union, Manifest Destiny started drawing more Americans to settle here. This is a Jemez Pueblo land grant from 1864. The U.S. reclaimed much of the land provided to the Puebloan peoples after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and in 1897, U.S. v. Sandoval reaffirmed that all the land grants held by the Mexican government were now property of the U.S. under the treaty. This boy suit was worn by a child at Fort Union in New Mexico Territory, and that creepy doll and stroller also belonged to a soldier's child at the fort. These are relics recovered from frontier New Mexico forts. That is a peace pipe smoked by the Chiricahua Apache leader Cochise and an Indian agent as they forged a peace treaty in 1859. There's an exchange between some Indian agents, and that is Kit Carson's tobacco pouch. He received the beaded leather pouch from the Ute. That is the Sutler's Ledger from 1863. Sutler sold provisions to soldiers, and this is the one from Fort Union. There's an 1873 Springfield rifle, and the one on the right was found after a raid by Geronimo's band of Apaches. These are bottles from Fort Sumner. These likely belong to soldiers, not the native prisoners of the Bosque Redondo Reservation there, which was pretty terrible. There was a New Mexico campaign during the Civil War. Bands of Confederates, mostly from Texas, raided New Mexico to secure the territory. This is a cavalry saber. That is a Confederate mountain howitzer from the Glorieta Pass battlefield, known as the Gettysburg of the West. And that shell was found after the Battle of Valverde, which the Union lost. This saddle belonged to Colonel Eugene Carr, who led cavalry units during the war, mostly in a campaign against Native Americans. These artifacts were recovered from Valverde. While the Confederates faced heavy casualties during that battle, the Union did leave the road open towards Santa Fe, so the Confederates did temporarily occupy Santa Fe. A Confederate snare drum that was likely used at the Battle of Glorieta Pass. Here are some revolvers from the Civil War, and some other relics recovered from Glorieta Pass. Those are some post-war land-grant maps, 
and this trunk was brought by immigrants from Germany to Elizabethtown, New Mexico. There was a lot of lawlessness in towns like Elizabethtown during the Wild West days, and one legendary outlaw in particular made a name for himself in New Mexico during the Lincoln County War, Billy the Kid. This is a letter sent by Billy the Kid from jail to the territorial governor, Lou Wallace, originally from Crawfordsville, Indiana. The Kid proposed to the governor in this that he would be willing to testify in a murder trial if Wallace would dismiss some charges against him. In the latter part of the century, railroads started passing through New Mexico, and reports of the natural beauty and exoticism of the land of enchantment started bringing more and more people out west. People came for their health, art, nature, solitude, along with scientific and cultural interest. Those are some railroad passes, and it's important to note that New Mexico territory included much of Arizona, Utah, and Nevada at this time. Wells Fargo shipped currency, including gold, along the western railroads. Outlaws figured this out, and so Wells Fargo shotgun messengers will carry these to try and protect themselves. This is a painting of the Pasatiempo Parade in Santa Fe by Gustav Baumann, a really interesting artist of German descent who spent much time at the Taos Artist Colony and here in Santa Fe. He did lots of hand rub woodblock prints and other woodcuts that were Japanese inspired, but much of his work also took an inspiration from New Mexico landscapes and culture. Adolf Bandelier was an archaeologist and anthropologist who explored and studied many of the Puebloan ruins of the southwest. There's his portable typewriter and some other personal articles. Since this state has so much spectacular geography, it was a photography destination way back in the day when it was much more difficult to take pictures. They have an exhibit on Fred Harvey, the man whom Southwestern Railroads went to to furnish and upkeep their restaurants, hotels, and souvenirs to help promote and accommodate tourism of the American Southwest. The Fred Harvey Company had a very high standard of service that became very well known at the time, so their hotels and restaurants had fancy silver and china imported from Europe. This is a plate and menu from the Fred Harvey Company's Montezuma Hotel in Las Vegas, New Mexico. It was a luxury health resort with a hot spring that kept burning down. Harvey girls were a signature component of the company. Young women of quote, good character, were recruited from the East and Midwest to work as waitresses at Harvey restaurants and lunchrooms. They were so well known that there is a movie made about them called Harvey Girls from 1946 starring Judy Garland. This is a sign from the Alvarado Hotel, which was operated by the Fred Harvey Company in Albuquerque. It was the largest Harvey Hotel, but it was sadly demolished in the 70s. This is some furniture from La Fonda here in Santa Fe. The hotel's furniture and interior was done by the architect Mary Jane Coulter. She also made some fantastic buildings at the Grand Canyon. The architecture and artistry, along with the high standards of the Fred Harvey Company and its railroad hotels here in New Mexico, significantly increased tourism to New Mexico and brought the territory onto the world stage. New Mexico was still a big territory throughout these developments and not a state. A historian named Robert Lawson wrote that, quote, an unfortunate but instinctive distrust of New Mexico's essentially foreign culture was the last and most durable brick added to the strong wall of opposition that prevented the territory from joining the Union until 1912. That's right, it took 66 years after the American flag was raised here in Santa Fe until New Mexico could finally become a state, largely just because it was culturally distinctive and more Mexican at the time. The 47th state was admitted to the Union on January 6, 1912, and then Arizona on February 14th. That is the statehood proclamation signed by President William Howard Taft. He did veto one the year before. Quote, I am happy to give you life. I hope you will be healthy. That is the pen used by President Tubby Taft to sign New Mexico into the Union. And that is the bilingual constitution of New Mexico, which ordered that state laws must be printed in English and Spanish for at least 20 years. That has largely continued and even many of the big placards at this museum are in both languages. That is the top hat worn by the first governor, William McDonald, at his inauguration in 1912. Those were First Lady Frances McDonald's gloves worn at the inauguration, as well as the governor's business card and wallet, and some other political memorabilia from the state's early days. 
those early days saw some trouble on the Mexican border because Pancho Villa and his Villistas invaded New Mexico in 1916. They attacked a town called Columbus and this was the Seth Thomas wall clock that was at the railroad station in Columbus and you can see where it was shot by the Villistas during the raid. The bullet actually stopped the clock so it's been frozen in time ever since Pancho Villa's raid. And you can see where the bullet went all the way through the clock in the back. That is a cool relic. The United States did go after the Villistas in the punitive expedition and eventually defeated them, but Pancho Villa was too elusive and escaped. Pancho Villa was assassinated while visiting Peral, New Mexico in 1923, so many years later, and this is one of the Revolutionary General's death masks. And this is a Villistas revolver that was recovered after the Columbus raid. It was apparently in a shipment sold to the Mexican army, but it ended up with a revolutionary Villista in New Mexico. There has been lots of mining in New Mexico, particularly of uranium. General Pershing and the US gave up on hunting Pancho Villa as World War I broke out. These are some propaganda posters for people to buy more Liberty Bonds. That trunk belonged to Lieutenant J.G. Holmes. And this wool World War I army jacket belonged to John Brockman of New Mexico. That's a World War I victory medal. Many of the servicemen from New Mexico during the Great War were Hispanics and Native Americans. This case has a variety of artifacts, including a cool jukebox, a record player, as well as some Hispanic religious folk art. When World War II broke out, New Mexicans again answered the call to duty, and that is Tom Dozier's Army Air Force uniform. He was from the Santa Clara Pueblo and became a sergeant. These are sketches by Harold E. West. He worked as a guard at the Japanese internment camp near Santa Fe that held over 4,500 people. So he documented the life of the camp with these sketches. The Reverend Tamasaku Watanabe carved these one pieces to pass the time at the Lordsburg and Santa Fe internment camps. Watanabe was a Japanese Christian minister from Hawaii, and he used this cross at camp religious services. Bernie Pyle was a very popular war correspondent from Dana, Indiana, but he lived in Albuquerque at the time of the war, though he was most often on the field. On the left is a thank you note sent by Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower to Pyle after Pyle sent him one of his books. And this is truly amazing. That is Ernie Pyle's last column. This two-page manuscript was in Pyle's pocket when he was shot and killed by a machine gun on an island near Okinawa on April 18th, 1945, just as the war was concluding. He often had premonitions of his death, and he predicted just before going to cover Okinawa that he would not survive the war. And it's interesting that his last handwritten column starts off with, quote, and so it is over. That's a fragment of a kamikaze plane that struck the USS New Mexico. The BB-40 battleship did reach Tokyo Bay by the end of the war. New Mexico was heavily involved in the top secret Manhattan Project, which produced the world's first atomic weapons. This oscillograph recorder camera captured data about the first atomic blast on July 16, 1945. The test blast at the Trinity site in the White Sands area near Alamogordo produced a glassy residue made of melted sand. Thus was created Trinitite. J. Robert Oppenheimer was head of the Los Alamos Laboratory near Santa Fe, which is one of the locations that researched and developed the atomic bomb. He is considered as the father of the atomic bomb, and when the first one was successfully tested at Trinity site, he brought up this phrase from the Bhagavad Gita, I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. The museum doesn't have too much post-World War II. Looks like this is a mock drive-in theater where they have a car split in half for some reason. This display shows the vast and impressive diversity of the state. It definitely seems to be the most openly multicultural state I've ever been to. There are some New Mexico related quotes on the walls. Not really sure what's happening here. They have another exhibit on the Manhattan Project. And here is a scale model of the Fat Man Bomb that was made by a Kentucky Boy Scout troop. This was the one dropped on Nagasaki, and it killed at least 80,000 people, 
but probably a lot more over time. This was J. Robert Oppenheimer's office chair at Los Alamos. As director of the scientific division, he oversaw the theoretical, experimental, chemistry, and metallurgy departments of the project. Los Alamos, along with Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Hanford, Washington, was a secret city, so all workers and even family members had to have identification cards and had to keep anything they knew strictly under wraps. That is some Manhattan Project insignia. New Mexico has continued to play a significant role in nuclear research because of the White Sands Missile Range. There are some model reactors. And that is a big canister of government-issued drinking water. This is a high-speed camera like the ones used to record and photograph the Trinity test. And that is some more Trinitite from the Trinity site, taken relatively close from the detonation point. So the atomic bomb is one of the rather consequential and terrifying legacies of the great state of New Mexico. This museum is really awesome, but there's a little bit more to it outside. The New Mexico History Museum was built onto a much older structure. In fact, the oldest government building in the United States. This is the Palace of the Governors on the north side of the Santa Fe Plaza. The adobe structure was built in 1610 by the Spanish territorial governor. The Spanish ruled vast portions of the Southwest, interrupted by the Pueblo Revolt, from this very building for centuries before the Mexicans took over. Then this became the American New Mexico's first territorial capital. General and Governor Lew Wallace wrote the final parts of his book, Ben-Hur, in this building. This is the back courtyard of the 400-year-old Palace of the Governors. The interior is preserved and is usually open, however they are currently restoring inside, so it is not open right now. That is extremely disappointing because it is such a historic building. I was really looking forward to going in there, but I'll do it another time. This tree was planted by the Spanish King Juan Carlos I, who has become rather unpopular. He abdicated the throne a few years ago and now lives in self-exile from Spain. There is one part of the palace open, the palace print shop and bindery. It's set up like a 19th century print shop. I think they will sometimes have an actual interpreter working inside here. This is the press of Gustav Bauman. While I mentioned he did a lot of woodblock prints during his time here, he was fond of printing papers and actually self-printed some beautifully designed books that showcase some of his artwork using this press. They have quite a few historic presses in here. It's a very big space and a nice addition to the museum. So that was the New Mexico History Museum. I would highly recommend a visit if you're in Santa Fe. Please check out my other Santa Fe videos and thanks for watching.